Hello, welcome to the July 29th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, my name is Greg Undo, and I will be the host of the live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through as expected on my end. Bear with me just for a moment. Hello, welcome to the July 29th. All right, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. Uh, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host for the live stream. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit uh, questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or if you wanted to just simply ask questions in the live chat field, you could ask there. Uh, when asking questions, <clears throat> if you could indicate which level of Cubase you're running, such as Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or if you're running other Steinberg pro programs, uh, which level of the program you're running. So if it's 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, which operating system. Um, and so that information is helpful. And if you don't get an immediate response, realize that I, sometimes I'll be 20 to 30 minutes behind the live chat. So I'll try my best to catch up as we go on throughout the live stream. Uh, but if you don't see an immediate response, if you could try to avoid asking the same question repeatedly, that'd be appreciated. It just kind of slows down the whole process. Um, we should have all of the topics uh, covered in today's live stream pinned to the top of the comments field uh, later tonight. And with timestamps, you could jump immediately to a particular uh, section. Uh, if you wanted to search for other uh, for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, I think we since the pandemic started, we've done over 19,000 topics. You could go to cubaseindex.com. We want to give special thanks to Jan for coming up with that website um, from Stockholm. And you, I think he's on already in the Cubase Index. Uh, we also want to give, we have two people that serve as moderators. We have Agent K and Jazz Dude, so they're not Steinberg employees. They just wanted to make it a better environment uh, for everyone involved. So we want to give special thanks to them. And also, uh, if you're looking for other uh, relevant information to the Steinberg community, you could check out the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazzdo does a lot of work with that and in compiling different tutorials that are relevant to the Steinberg community. Um, <clears throat> so since today is the last live stream of the month, uh, we will be doing uh, just a the Zoom meetup <clears throat> uh, starting in about two hours. So we'll have kind of a shorter than usual, um, uh, shorter than usual live stream. We'll go about two hours and I posted the link to it already. So if you wanted to look there, I'll try to post it about <clears throat> every half hour. <clears throat> and if you haven't gone to the Zoom meetup, it's a great way to meet uh, uh, other Steinberg users and other people that are that uh, participate in the live streams. So it's always a wonderful discussion. So I look forward to seeing some new faces. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. Okay, the first question today is, hi Greg, is there a logical editor preset that could select only the highest note in the chord part? Uh, when I use extract melody line preset, it never seems to select the highest notes. Could you help? All right, so let's say if we have chords that are set up, um, and we'll look at this in a key editor. So let's say we have our notes here. So we could just say, all right, so let's say we have an example kind of like this. We're gonna have a number of different chords. So let's come over to our MIDI logical editor. And one thing before we get started, uh, if you are watching the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. So let's come over here and do setup. So we want to let me just start this from scratch. So let's say we want to uh, select type is equal to notes. And I think if we do a context variable, we could say equal to the highest pitch, uh, let's say position in the chord. Um, so or let's highest in chord from at least two notes. So let's say, I think if we do this, 
and select Let's see if we set this to So let's say if we wanted to do like the seventh chords or let's say the fifths, we could just select by intervals here, but let's say let's see if we just choose that. Usually I would think that would work. Let's just see if there is the preset that you mentioned. over here. So if we do the highest pitch, we do that. But generally, I think if we would come over here, let's say I just wanted to do the lowest note in the chord. Just had my brain cramp on the first question today, so let me just... So let's say if I want to do the root note in the chord. And see if there's one of the presets. So let's see if we just do a copy here. So let's say if I have this event selected and let's copy that, that now when we look at this in our chord editor, our key editor, we can see that it's just kind of copied. So try just doing select here. Um, and let's see if I just want to select just this and let's go back to our first. And I just accidentally closed out, sorry about that. 
Yeah, so try just the uh, copy cord and just switch that to select. Sorry about that, Alex. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next question. All right, you see Nick checking in. We see Jazz Dude, uh, Uno Memento from Finland. Uh, and, and Uno Memento is asking if the Zoom meetup is today. So it is. So we'll start in about a little less than two hours. We have Sir Robert from Atlanta. We see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right. Um, okay, we see Robbie Bowling checking in from Dallas. All right, we see Jan from Stockholm. Um, all right, uh, so we see what's the difference between WAVE and MPEG, and when should one be used over the other? So an MPEG, like an, when we go to export files, we'll see an MPEG file here. So if we just come over to uh, like your export, audio mix down. So generally WAV files are gonna be full resolution files. MPEG one layer three are going to be uh, compressed files. So they're, they're about 10% of the file size. You generally always have to convert an MP3 file or an MPEG one three, layer three file to a WAV file to do editing. So, you know, generally it's always better to use WAV files and if you needed to email uh, like a small mix down file to someone, you could send them an MP3 file if, if you wanted to attach it in an email and the WAV file is too big. But generally if you could, you know, it's a good idea to always work with WAV files because if you need to do any editing, the, way, the MP3 will always need to be converted to a WAV file. Okay, so we see if I have a loop on one channel on Halion that builds uh, from a few elements, I want to split each one of the elements to a different channel on Halion. Is it possible? All right, so let me just go ahead and open up an instance of Halion. So I'm not sure if it's just like a little sequence or an actual loop loop, like a drum loop. So we'll just get this open and let's say I wanna start with maybe like a B box. So we'll come over here and I'll check my audio connections quickly. Okay, sorry about that. All right. All right, so let's say I have, um, you know, my B-Box loop. And let's say I wanted to just put uh, like a bass sound, like a synth bass.
All right, I'm gonna put this onto a different track. So say I'm gonna just have my bass here. So say now I wanted to, we'll add a MIDI track here. So we'll just have this as being, so let's say we have our drums. So we'll start off here. I'll just get to the macro. All right, and now like I want this. All right, so let's say I just wanted to sequence along with this. So now when we play back, we'll just have kind of both of these playing at the same time. So let's say this is going to be our loop. And I'll just undo the quant automatic quantize. So now as we play. Okay, so let's say we have both of those kind of playing. Um, so if we wanted to split those, uh, so let's just come here, let's get to the macro view. Um, so if I wanted to just drag this pattern out, so we'll go ahead and stop this from playing. So let's say I have these kind of going, you know, two different sounds and howling in for my beat. So let's say as we play. So if I wanted to split these out, let's say I will send this to output two uh, for the bass. And I'll make sure that when we go to I'll put two that's not muted. All right, so the question is, do you want to split the elements to a different channel in Halion? So I'm not sure if this is kind of what you wanted to do, but if we have this, you know, we could have, uh, you know, I think 32 stereo outs and a 5-1 out. Uh, but if we wanted to, at this point, just take this and you know, select both of those and go to our render in place. Uh, so we'll just say, okay, let's go ahead and render those two different sections that we can now convert these uh, directly into audio. So let me know if that's what you want to do and how you want to split the channels. Um, and if you wanted to, you know, bounce both of these together, so let's say if we, if I wanted to take this, these two, and it's, and we also see, uh, can I load that into groove agent? So at this point, if we had, um, done a, a render in place, we could go to our render settings and we'll choose to channel settings and then we can mix down to one file. And then we could take this particular uh, instrument here. So let's say I wanted to load it into uh, a Halion. You know, so any audio file, I could just drag and drop that particular audio file directly to an instrument sound. So if I wanted to take just, you know, a particular sound from Halion, we could just drag and drop it onto different instrument pads. All right, so we see Vinny Sabatino checking in from Florida, Orlando. Okay, so we see a uh, question. When I convert a mono audio file to stereo via the mono to multi-channel option, I'm getting an error message, merge is not possible. Why? So, you know, generally if you convert just a straight mono recording, um, it's, it's probably, you know, the intention of that is, so if it's just a single file and we come over to the project 
and let's say we want to uh, do the convert tracks mono to multi-channel that's intended to take like two mono tracks to turn it into a stereo interleaved or six tracks into a 5.1 interleaved. It's not going to take just one single mono track and turn that into a stereo file. So that's kind of the intention of the feature. All right, so we see Peter Bata joining us from Montreal. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Ruggiero checking in from Padova, Italy. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. Um, uh, question, uh, the phase invert option won't solve the phase issue, especially on shakers and stereo. Any recommendations on how to fix this? Uh, Cubase 10.5. So, you know, if you have, uh, you know, shakers, you know, so, you know, what the invert phase function is going to do is invert phase. So I'm not sure what, uh, what particular phase issue that you have on which shakers, but you know, what it's going to do is to, you know, once we have the invert phase on, so let's say as we're looking here, we can see after this point that the waveform is cresting upward in positive territory. So if I click on the invert phase, we'll see that the phase of the waveform, uh, just, you know, is inverted just like that. So, but you know, I'm not sure uh, when you say, um, says uh, won't solve the phase issue, especially for shakers and stereo. So, you know, but you know, that is inverting the phase. So, you know, maybe the shakers aren't out of phase. So if you give, maybe give a little more context, a little more information, that'd be helpful. chat field just jumped um so we have a question hi greg i've set up my writing room in quad have quad bus and stereo bus disconnected in outputs uh, as i use control room how do i export both a quad and stereo fold down mix offline um all right so let's say if we come here and let's just uh, i'll just revert this particular project Okay, so I'm not sure if you're just doing, let me just. Okay, so let's say, you know, a lot of times what I would do if I wanted to do like a quad and a stereo mix uh, output. So if we go to your audio connections, um, at this point, let's say I have my stereo out here and let's choose uh, like, let's say a quad out. Okay, so let's, all right. So I have this set up and I'll just choose this to not be connected. Um, so when we go to export, Audio mix down, uh, at this point we could say multi and then just export uh, stereo and quadraphonic output. And then that would uh, print the stereo and quadraphonic outputs, uh, assuming that you had you know, those outputs being routed correctly, but that should be able to take the same project and be able to create uh, the stereo and quad outputs and render those uh, one right after each other without having to reset anything. Okay, so we see a uh, question uh, shifting from Ableton to Cubase. Can anybody tell me where to start from? Um, you know, so, you know, really could depend on what type of work you want, but, you know, if you have any particular questions, like, you know, how do I do this in Cubase? You know, we're here to kind of help you with that. So... All right, and we see the artist known as Love checking in from New York. Thanks for joining us. All 
All right, so we just see uh, how can we make uh, Indian classical beat. Um, so let's see if there's there's probably going to be some ethnic. I know that if we go to Halion six, that's sold separately. But let's take a look at what maybe some ethnic percussion stuff that's going to be in uh, side of Cubase. So let's see if we go to drums, percussion. Um, and see if we get a world ethnic. So if I wanted to have and I'm gonna be the world worst world's worst Indian uh, percussionist, but let's say if I wanted to come here. And let's say if we go to channel two. So at this point, you know, we could just do a quick sequence of some kind. So, and excuse me for my ignorance on the genre, um, but we'll just kind of show you mechanically what you could do. So let's say we'll just kind of take this particular sound and I'll just put this into a quick cycle mode um, and let's say I'll just put my click on take off my auto quantize sorry about that so let's just say So, I mean, you could make kind of beats just kind of programming it. You could also just kind of draw in particular notes. And if you wanted to just come over here and look at it in like a drum editor. And at this point we could um, choose to only see, you know, the particular notes here. So you could kind of, you know, program different sound so um and if you get into uh Hallian, which is sold separately or Hallian sonic um you'll you can get into so let's say if we add an instrument track and we'll just go to the Hallian sampler then this doesn't come with cubase but sold separately uh but now i think that there's kind of a ethnic percussion So let's go to world percussion here. So let's say, okay, I just want it to have, so let's go over to like the macro view here. Um, So that there are there will be kind of some uh, different, you know, world percussion instrument sounds here as well. So, um, but as you. these would automatically synchronize to the tempo. So this way you have kind of like a dedicated uh, world percussion instrument inside.
So a couple of different uh, tools to allow you to kind of work with that. So I don't do a lot of Indian music programming, unfortunately. All right, but hopefully that could get you started. All right, so we have Brian Sawyer from Crystal Coast, North Carolina, and Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Okay, so we have a question from Larry, the photo key. Uh, quick question, what is the point of the audio input channel? Do you gain stage there? So it gives you another level of gain. So let's say if we come to our mix console and we wanted to see all of our input channels and as we slide over, you know, we could, you know, let's say if we have too much signal coming in, we could adjust the gain before or after, but we also could print plugins and EQ and dynamics uh, before the signal is recorded. So if we wanted to put insert effects like to print through a guitar amplifier uh, or we needed to get more gain, you know, we could adjust our gain here as well. So I've often used it like for live recordings. Uh, I remember I used it pretty extensively. I was, I was an engineer on Eric Clapton's Crossroads project at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. And of course, everyone says that they're playing as loud as they ever will during sound check, and then immediately during the concert, it gets to be about 12 dB louder. So what I could do is just take all of my input channels, and then I could, you know, gradually bring them down between songs to adjust the record level so it wasn't too hot. So it just allows you another gain, uh, a gain stage that you could use if needed. Okay, so we have Rob from Tarpon Springs, Florida. It says, uh, sorry if I missed the answer to this last week. My question is regarding the option where you export a MIDI file. What is the export resolution adjustment for? Okay, so when we go to um, you know, export information as a MIDI file, so let's say we go to export MIDI file, all right, and so, and at this point we can see export resolution because many times that people are taking MIDI files, um, different sequencers may have different PPQ resolution. So, you know, some sequencers would be 96 PPQ, like early ones, you know, that means 96 parts per quarter note. Uh, Cubase does everything at the sample level. So, you know, we could go to one 192 thousandth of a second for the MIDI resolution. But when we need to work with other programs that don't work with sample-based MIDI resolution or hardware sequencers and keyboard workstations, um, at that point, they, don't, they can't recognize that particular resolution. So you could export the resolution. If you know it's going to a hardware uh, sequencer and you know it's only 120 parts per quarter note, then you could adjust that as you export the MIDI file. So... Most of the time, you don't have to worry about it with uh, if you're exporting it to import into a different program, but it's when you're imp importing it into different hardware options that it becomes more of an issue. All right, so we have Wilhelm uh, Campman, Campman, so thanks for joining us. All right, so we see uh, Distant Identity just updated to Cubase 12. Congratulations. Great. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, any chance to do the resampling in Cubase? I need to put the tracks to the folder and then create an audio track with input folder and then resampling. Um, so if we want it, you know, we could do that definitely. So, you know, if we want it to, um, you know, a lot of people let's come over, just show a quick example here. You know, so a lot of times people may just do resampling, um, and kind of, you know, do internal routing. 
So, which is fine, you know, but there's a couple of other ways that are kind of more offline, which may be faster. Cause obviously if you're doing kind of real time routing, like where we send this to a group channel and then we add an audio track from the group channel. So and we'll say, okay, this is gonna be our input. It's gonna be group one. So now if we wanted to, you know, record the bass on this particular element, let's say as we're doing it, you know, we can just come over here and kind of print internally. So this way we're just kind of uh, resampling that way. But, you know, if you wanted to take, you know, for instance, all of these, you know, different drum parts here and say, okay, I want it to just bounce all these down, like all these files. Uh, you know, one of the things you could do is you know, and you could do this with MIDI tracks as well. I could say, okay, let's just uh, go to render in place. And I could say, let's do channel settings and mix down. And then much faster than you could, you know, record. Everything could be rendered down to one particular file. You could also, so all my drums will be kind of, you know, instead of doing a, you know, typical resampling, you could do the render in place or, you could also just export audio mix down, and that would also be faster than real time resampling. So, um, so there's a couple of different ways of approaching that. So, you know, if you want to generate an audio file, you could do it, you know, quickly, a couple of other ways, maybe a little faster. All right, so we see Gerald Ely is recommending the Tabla library from Steinberg. So, all right, and we see Michael Teams has granted me one gallon of pineapple mango ice cream for my family and myself. Thank you very much. Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. And we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. All right, we have Captain Energy Music from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. Okay, so it says, uh, please, I need help panning MIDI in the sampler track. I want to be able to pan individual notes. Okay, so let's come over. All right, let me just find a quick. Okay, so let's say I'll just kind of create a sampler track from that. So now, all right. So, you know, what we could do is, you know, cause this is gonna be just kind of like a single sample, but if I wanted to just, you know, do different panning, you know, once we have the notes, it is a VST 3.5 playback. So I could say, So let me just make these notes a little shorter. So, you know, once we have this set, so if we just click here, we could say double click opens note expression editor. And as we play back, um, yeah, and you go to note expression, you can say, okay, I want to do panning. So at this point, I can say, okay, I want this panned center. I want the next note to be panned hard left. And these notes can play back simultaneously. So let's come here, let's make that hard right and make this panned center again. So as we would just kind of play back the individual notes here. And I'll just go ahead and
And even if I wanted to take, let's say, that last note, and let's say I want that last note to pan, uh, I could just take, you know, this. And so we could have individual panning on different notes. So if I wanted to play back a different note and have this pan maybe the opposite direction, I could just come again right here. So we could have independent pannings on every single note. So let's say center, right, left. And those will both kind of sweep. So you could do it kind of at the note level, um, so which can make it a little more uh, you know, a, a lot more flexible because it, each note can actually be, uh, have its own individual panning on a note by note basis. Okay, we have a question. Uh, can you please show how to use external hardware or guitar pedals as a plugin in Cubase? So what you need to do is go to your audio connections menu. Uh, we'll go to the external effects tab. So here we could click on add external effects. So let's say, okay, I want a uh, distortion pedal. So we'll come right over here. We'll give it a name. Let's say distortion plus. I'll go vintage. All right. So now at this point, I wanted to put it on this particular audio track. We go to inserts. And now at this point, we would go to, we'll say external plugins we say external like let's say our distortion plus so we connect it to the inputs and outputs of our audio interface and I'll point that out here so when we go to the external effects as soon as we come here we want to it has to be connected into the audio interface so as soon as we come over here we say this is going in and out of this particular interface. Uh, so some some hardware, uh, especially like older digital reverbs and delays will have their own uh, latency path. So, you know, to compensate for any of the latency, you could just come right over there and now you could choose to measure the delay. And at that point, you could just simply, uh, as you play, the signal goes out through your audio interface into your, uh, into your external processor and then the output of your external processor is going back into the interface and then we could compensate for any timing irregularities on that particular path so that's how you could get it set up realize that sometimes the impedance of guitar pedals may not agree with the impedance of your audio interface so some people make solutions for that um, I think Michael Wagner used to have kind of a box that was designed that he was marketing uh, specifically for that so but just be aware but that's how you get different um, you know different actual events to go out to the real world and also let's say um, you know one other thing if you wanted to be a little more flexible with sampling on different pads if you wanted like perhaps on an instrument level, you know, one of the cool things that you could do in the sampler track, so let's say if we come here to our sampler track, I could just at this point, we see this little, um, so we'll just come and we'll switch it to our sampler content here. But we'll see this and we could say, let's transfer to Groove Agent SE. And now I could have each of the different sounds. So let's say if I wanted to uh, just come here to pitch, we could say, we go to pitch and we'll say our, our pitch range. Let's say C3 through C4. So now I could take each of these individual pads and say, okay, I want this. And let's pan this note right and then we could just, you know, pan individual notes, uh, you know, just, just like so. So that that's another method. So if, if you want to do panning, you could also do it in Groove Agent. But you know, you get a little, a lot more flexibility with the actual notes, where you could change a note and have different panning.
All right. Uh, so we see a question. Is inverting the phase on the timeline the same as flipping the phase to 180 on the pre-gain? So if you're not familiar with the where, the, where to set it in the pre-gain, once you get to the EQ, you can see the phase here. So uh, this actually, you know, when we do it from the info field, you know, so when I select an event here and we invert the phase, that actually changes the actual audio waveform. Whereas when we do on the channel level, that's just kind of flipping the phase in real time. So, but they kind of get you to the same spot in the end, but this doesn't actually physically flip in, this doesn't physically invert the phase here. Uh, but it, as it plays back, it, it inverts it in real time. But the audible effect will be the same. All right, so we see Brian Grieve music on. Thanks for joining us. So my chat field just jumped. Okay, so we see a uh, question from C Notes. Uh, when exporting an MP3, what is the best uh, bit rate for export? Also, should high quality mode be checked, or could you explain what that is? So, you know, as we go, as we do an export audio mix down, uh, and we choose MP3, we could choose kind of the amount of compression. So, whether it's going to compress it so it's playing back 128 kilobytes per second, probably the higher the um, the bit rate here for the compression means less less compression and is generally considered uh, a higher quality. So you know depending upon the different uh, algorithms, so if you want to put it high quality mode, so you know if you just export something as a 16 bit for the, you know 16 for the bit rate here for 16 kilobytes per second versus 320, you'd hear a pretty noticeable difference. Most people would do 320, and I think if you share MP3s for different streaming services, that they will ask for 320 because that's kind of the standard for that. So this just allows you to have kind of different algorithms for the compression. So, uh, so go for the highest one you know possible, uh, you know, because you are sacrificing some of the quality. But you know, if you need to fit it. You know, in a, someone's email only takes five megabytes and, you know, you're six megabytes big at 320, you know, go down a little smaller for that. But it's really, you know, every time you decrease the size, you decrease the quality a bit. So just, just remember that. And if you always have the option, you know, export the full, full resolution wave file. See Graham Witcher just saying, I uh, can't believe it's almost August. So, all right. So, we see uh, Roby Becky just saying, just checking out the live stream to always thank Greg for his amazing help. Tutorials and great way of teaching all of us. So, glad it's been helpful. Um, all right, uh, so it says, uh, I came in at the end of you talking about recording and printing with Cubase plugins. Can you demonstrate how to do that? Thank you. Yeah, I just posted a tutorial. I think it was uh, finally shared on Thursday about kind of recording with plugins in Cubase, but let's say if we have an audio channel, and let's say I was I wanted to record, um, you know, guitar. So I'm just gonna add an audio track. 
Um, we'll say it's going into mono in one. And at this point, um, we want it to go to the stereo out. We'll give it a name. Okay, so we, we when we come over here, we could just say, okay, I want to go to my mix console, and we see that we have mono in one, so I'm going to make sure that the input channels are visible. This is my input channel for the guitar. So a lot of times when we record a uh, guitar, it's going to be recorded dry, and if we have effects on as inserts, we hear the insert, but it's not actually embedded into the file. If we go to the input channel here, um, and we wanted to put like a guitar, the VST amp rack, we can come over here to the VST amp rack, and at this point, when it's on the input channel, we could actually print through this guitar amp so that that is kind of cooked in or burned into the file. So this way we could, now one of the issues with this on some plugins, they may impose latency and you might hear a delay as you're tracking. So that could be, you know, very off-putting for a lot of people, and they could be confused, you know, it's almost like watching a badly dubbed movie, you know, and it's like, you know, it's not quite matching up what they're saying, you know. So the latency can be a little unsettling for some people. A lot of plugins you can track through without additional latency on the actual input path. So that's how you could do it. So... You could put the insert on, and if you check out, uh, it was just on Wednesday, if you go to youtube.com slash Cubase, there's a whole kind of tutorial on that. Okay, um, so I think kind of a follow-up question is, how can I record, example, the voice or guitar part with FXs and without them together? Uh, and without them together at the same time, I saw that it's possible, but forgot how. So again, it's just going to be each input track you could have. So if this track is going to um, input two, you know, I could come right over here and we'll say, okay, I want to go to mono in two. When we go to our inputs, then I could have different effects. So let's say on my voice, I just want it to have, you know, a compressor. So I'm gonna go dynamics and let's say, okay, I just wanted my vintage compressor here. So, and then I could print through the compressor on the vocals and the, and the VST amp rack on the guitars and have those sounds kind of embedded and cooked in. All right, so we see Michael Pierce on the live stream and he just passed Royal Wooten Bassett. All right, we see Cubase Drunkie just transfer one of his friends in real life to switch to Cubase. So we'll hopefully we'll see him on the live stream. Thanks for your support. All right, so we see Soren checking in from Sweden. See that my my Cubase color scheme is giving um, Christmas vibes to Cubase Junkie. Uh, so we see a uh, question. Uh, Hi, Greg. Any idea if Steinberg have a CC121 replacement in the pipeline? Now it is no longer in production. Yeah, so the CC121 was actually just kind of a victim of some part shortages. So it's, you know manufactured by Yamaha um, so um, so but you know they haven't announced anything so I wouldn't expect anything 
you know, imminently. So, so if you get your hands on the CC121, it's always a great thing. It's still a wonderful interface. All right. Um, All right, so we have a question from uh, Wendell Koss. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Wendell from Amsterdam here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, how can I make s uh, safe default quick controls with my new tracks uh, so they load automatically when adding VSTI slash audio slash sampler group, et cetera? I'm using new MIDI remote. So what I would do, you know, because I think when we go to add a track, you know, so let's say we add an audio track here, um, and we go to quick controls that, you know, by default, none are loaded up, which I could see why it would make sense to do that. Uh, so, but let's say if I wanted to have my default audio track here, um, you know, what I could do, I think if we save this as a track preset, so save track preset, and we'll just say QC default. So now when I go to add a track, uh, and I know this is kind of a workaround, but we could say, um, you know, we could just say, okay, I want to load a track using track preset. And, you know, you know if we wanted to, and you could be smart and say, let's go to, So we can just say, you know, QC default here. And then, you know, at that point we could add the track and then all the quick controls are kind of added. So unfortunately, when you, if you add it as a track preset, you could, you know, have default quick controls. And if you want it to even just have like, you know, your track presets, if we come over here, let's say we go to uh, user presets and we'll say track presets audio. Uh, at this point, I could just say, uh, I want my quick control default, and I could just drag and drop, and then all my quick controls I want by default will be loaded directly there. All right, uh, so we see uh, best way to question, uh, best um Best way to live stream Cubase 12 with sound um, via OBS with Yellow Duck to Instagram Live. I'm not getting any sound. What am I doing wrong? So depending on your audio interface, um, like your audio interface may have a loopback function, and that would probably be the best way to do it. Uh, I haven't done uh, Yellow Duck. What I do for my system is I have one audio interface for Cubase. I take the analog output of my Cubase computer and I feed that into a Yamaha mixer that has a USB out. That mixer also has this microphone connected to it and I use the Yamaha mixer for, um, for the live stream and I use my audio interface for the, you know, for Cubase. And then I don't have to worry about changing sample rates and all sorts of very creative routing. I know a lot of people do it with a uh, voice meter, um, I know a lot of people, you know, don't get it working with voice meter and other similar utilities. So, okay, all right. We're gonna thank Jazz Dude for his moderation. I'm going to go ahead and post the link again for the live stream. We'll be starting in about an hour. All right, so I know we had questions that were sent in, so let's go ahead and get to some of those. Bear with me just for a moment. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. Okay, so we had a, a question, this is uh, from Glenn. Um, it says, when placing the cursor, for example, at the beginning, and let me just jump to another project here. Bear 
me just for a moment. Okay, so let's go ahead and just Okay, so a uh, question. Uh, when placing the cursor, for example, at the beginning of a recorded part or event, then open in the sample editor window, I cannot see the waveform that should be on that bar place until I press play. Uh, this never happened in Cubase 10. Are there, is there a preference or some other setting for this? Um, so what I do, so let's say if we're, you know, if we have the editor selected, um, you know, what I always have done is just double click um, and let me just, so now when I, I just double click that I would see those particular events there. So it's not, um, when it's selecting, but you know, just double clicking should automatically, I, I'm not sure if that behavior has changed. You know, some, some things had changed in Cubase 12. Um, but let's see if I choose edit active clip here, you know, whatever I click on, um, and I'm not sure also if this is tied into, um, if we go to transport, if we have use video falls edit mode where that will select and then, you know, if I hit play, but I always just double click and that would make the event show up in the editor, uh, you know, but there are some, whether you want to edit, edit all clips or ed edit active clip. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to show clips and events or just show the events, but, you know, to me, it's always whatever I want to see, I would just double click and that would automatically populate the sample editor to whatever is selected, which I think is consistent with Cubase 10. Um, let me know if you see it differently. Uh, so I see um, question. Uh, hi, Greg. When I opened Cubase 12 yesterday and the presets for the workspaces, the settings for preferences, and some other presets and configurations are gone, even the settings I have, <clears throat> for the CC 121 is missing. How can this happen? I tried to fix with the profile manager <clears throat> with no luck. Um, so if you had the profile manager, you know, it could be like sometimes when you start Cubase, make sure, you know, so let's say if I come here, let's say if I start kind of an older version, I'm just going to hold down. Uh, you may get this little prompt like, you know, if there is a plugin that caused a particular crash, you can start it in safe mode. So make sure that, you know, you didn't, you know, if you did this and you deleted the program preferences, you know, that could get rid of that. Or if you disable the program preferences. So maybe if you, you know, start the program and hold down the, you know, command option shift or alt control plus shift and use the current program preferences. If you did save everything before, you know, before the, if the preferences, you know, were erased, you know, then, you know, you should be able to recall it with a particular profile, but make sure that you, you know, sometimes people want to recover a profile that they didn't save before. So make sure that you actually have the profile saved. Okay, so we had a question, um, how to have the cursor move to the beginning of an event automatically when selecting it? Okay. So all we have to do to achieve that, and I'll just, I'll just exit out of Cubase elements here real quick. Okay, so if we want the cursor to move to the beginning of the selected event, 
To enable that, we would go to the transport and select uh, use video follows edit mode. Otherwise, the cursor will stay the same, but if you always want the cursor to navigate directly to the start of the event, then once you check this option under transport, at this point we could just say, okay, I want to take these particular files and as I select the event, the particular, uh, the playhead position will automatically move to the beginning of that particular event. So use that. All right, uh, <clears throat> so I saw comments <clears throat> in uh, Tuesday's live stream in the comments field about uh, matching the tempo from a reference track uh, from one audio file to another. So not necessarily using the reference track as a, like a sonic guide, a sonic reference or a groove reference. So what I did here, let's say if I have a couple of different audio tracks and I liked the timing, the tempo of this particular track. So what I did is I just selected this particular uh, audio track and I went to project and I did a tempo detection and Cubase, you know, dutifully came through and just temp figured out the tempo of this live performance. All right, now let's say I have another song and I know that the tempo of this song is 130 beats a minute. So let's say I want to do more of a... All right, so... You know, let's just say, and if I don't know what the tempo of this particular file is, I could, again, just go to the project and go to tempo detection. Um, if the tempo is varying, like we see in this example, in this example, and if I wanted to take and embed these particular tempo changes, kind of these micro accurate, hyper accurate tempo detections and I wanted to embed it in the file, I would come over here and choose uh, audio to advanced and set definition from tempo. And then at this time, we could em embed the actual tempo changes into the audio file or into the project. Now, if we know that a particular track here is a steady tempo of 130 beats a minute, and we know what the tempo is, uh, at this point, I could just make sure I go into my media menu, into the pool window, and make sure that we see that this track is 130 beats a minute. Now we could place these tracks into musical mode, two different ways. One is to take this particular track and we could place it into musical mode right here. Or we could choose to at this point, select the event and go to musical mode here. So let's say I wanted this track to follow the reference tempo of this. I'm just going to drag it over. Okay, so I'll just move this. A and let's say we're going to go ahead and start. So we'll listen to kind of the original tempo of the original song. This is about like 118. So I want to mute this. So right now this isn't this is still following the original tempo. But if I place this into musical mode, it's now following the tempo. So if I take it out of musical mode, no correlation, so this isn't using the reference tracks tempo, but I could just come right over here. And we could do a horrible audio mis mashup. But the tempo of this track is used as a reference for this track, so 
If it's a steady tempo, just make sure that the tempo is set in the media bay or in the uh, pool window rather. Sorry about that. And then make sure that you have musical mode active. If it's varying tempo, that's when you need to go to the audio to advanced and say set definition from tempo. Then I could just take, you know, two different tracks and then have them match tempo. But we could also, you know, just take, you know, once we have those set to musical mode, if I do a tempo change here, let's say I just want to take this tempo and speed it up. Now both tracks will automatically speed up. So that's how we could use uh, the tempo reference from one track and apply it to another track. All right, so I think Soren had the question in the last live stream of, I have a bunch of audio recordings and how to turn these into lanes without having to drag one by one like so. So, which can be tedious and not fun at all. All right, so if there was a method for making this easier. Um, so I kind of came up with a macro and a workflow that I think would make sense. Um, so first of all, what I want to do is, you know, if I have these in my project, um, I'm gonna go to my pool window and I'm just gonna select these particular audio events here. And I'm gonna drag them to an empty audio track. And we could import multiple files to the same audio track and we'll get this little prompt window of do we want to put these into separate tracks or into one track? We're gonna choose one track. And then what I want to do is I'm gonna select all of these events and then we could right click and we'll choose clean up. Uh, what I want to do next is we're gonna move all these events. Let's say these are all kind of recorded roughly in the same time on different tracks. So what I want to do is to take these different events and I want to adjust the timing. So I'm gonna to go to edit and choose move to origin. And that's gonna place them kind of all on top of each other, but still all in one lane at this point. I'm going to right click and we'll say clean up lanes. And now each of the takes will be automatically placed into their own lane, just like that. So if you have a hundred takes, that'll be kind of a much faster way of doing it. And if you want it to kind of do this from a macro standpoint to make it even faster. Um, so I will just go ahead and I'm just gonna drag these in from the pool window. All right, and I'm gonna put them all into one track. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, let's say I have my lanes closed here. And I'm gonna select the channel and I created a macro. So I'll go to my key commands and we will show macros. All right, and we called it track to lane. So what it's gonna do is select every event on this particular channel. It's going to take all of the selected events and move those events to origin and then clean up lanes. So again, our steps are select all on the tracks, kind of just what we did, but we're just kind of automating this process so we can hit one button and trigger this. Uh, move the events to their origin time and then clean up lanes. So when I execute this macro now, I'll just come here, close this. So it's come to my macros and I'll say uh, track to lanes. And now if we want to just look, all of our audio events are now put onto individual tracks just like that. So let me know if that will work for you, Swarn. <clears throat> All 
All right, so we had a question. Um, so it says, I don't think this is a question uh, that has a positive answer at the moment, but I'm hoping that you asking might prompt a response for a colleague in the development team as otherwise very happy migrant from uh, DP. One of the features from that program I missed is the flexibility of click and tempo. I'm writing in queue at present that flips back and forth between 4.4 and 12.8. The underlying tempo stays the same. Uh, that is to say, in the 4-4 sections, quarter note is 93 beats per minute, and in the 12-8 sections, the dotted quarter note is also 93. Uh, in DP, this is the easiest thing in the world to move from one to the other while Cubase, it's a pain in the neck. Um, do we have the ability to define tempo and values other than quarter note? Is it a cornerstone of music theory? All right, so let's say, you know, I think this gets to be, um, let's say we have... Um, All right, so let's say we have um, our different tempo. So let's say you know we're in 4-4 four, four time, and we listen to our click. Now we could also have our click kind of represented uh, in you know different beats as well. So let's say, okay, so and let's say, you know, we go to 4-4, four, four, and let's say we have a 12-8 measure. Now, a lot of times when we do 12-8, um, you, know, you may have like subdivisions that sound kind of like this. Um, so you, we could go to our metronome, our click patterns. So if we wanted to come here, let's say, but let's just say um, when I go to my click pattern, I'll, I'll just switch this so that we could hear uh, like our 12-8 pattern here, but we'll see that the kind of the, the the pulse of the beat is changing. So, so what we want to have is when we look at this, I want to take these and have again kind of the same pulse with this. All right, so now if we listen to going from our 4-4 four, four to 12-8, we're going to notice that the pulse will change. All right, and then when we go back to 4-4, four, four, it will seem... faster. So when if we wanted to make those kind of the same pulse... For musicians, when you get when you have the 12-8 areas, if we select the particular beat here, uh, like the tempo value, um, we go to the project logical editor, and I made a preset for this kind of right before the live stream. Um, We call it four four. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the uh, so he selected this property so that the musicians can have like a steady, um, you know, steady metronome. So what we're going to do is actually just take the pulse here, and I know that this is a bit of a workaround, uh, but we could just say okay, our media type is equal to tempo. We're going to take our selected tempo. We go under action target and we'll choose transform to start with and we're going to multiply by 1.5 so i'm going to take this selected tempo when we go to 12 8. so now when we listen to it we'll have the same pulse and then we go back to 4 4 here And we could change the click here so that uh, if we wanted to change the click pattern so that we could just say, let's make it consistent with the other click patterns so the musicians. So we can see that even though we have kind of 12, eight now, uh, the question gets asked usually at this point, you know, what about, you know, if I'm doing this for musicians that are reading this, you know, how do I convey that to them? So let's go ahead and look at this in our score editor. So let's say, um, 
we'll go ahead and we'll just put in, if we go to form symbols, we can say, okay, we'll see this uh, tempo indication. So let's go ahead and just kind of blow this up a little bit here. So when I put this in, we can say, you know, quarter note equals 120. But let's say I want it dotted quarter note to equal um, a, you know, at this bar where we get a 12, eight, I could right click here and just choose dotted quarter equals 80. So at this point, you know, we could take our different, we could say quarter equals 120 and 44 and dotted quarter equals 80 so that it's playing back at the same pulse. Uh, but you could have it notated that way for people conducting and musicians that are reading uh, the score if you're doing that. So, all right, let's jump back to our live discussion. Thanks for all the great questions sent in advance. And again, if you learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. All right, so let me go back to the live chat. Bear with me just for a moment and I'll catch up. All right, so I just see from uh, Jay Hatchie says, uh, hi Greg, have I missed my question submitted before the stream started? So. Uh, yeah, sometimes it, when they're kind of sent in like, you know, a half hour before, sometimes they get kind of, uh, lost as soon as we start the live stream. So feel free to ask it again. Reading through comments. All right, so we see uh, Roby just saying, uh, like they have two interfaces that make so much sense. Uh, I can't afford two right now, but I have a Zoom Live Track 12 interface. It has loop back, it seems. I failed something in OBS or Cubase. Yeah, so usually those settings, you know, with the loopback, it's just kind of once it's enabled, it may only take like the first input and, and use that for the loopback for like your microphone. So check out to make sure that you have, so sometimes it's only the first input of an audio interface that will be utilized for the loopback function. All right, so we have Jovanovic 3D checking in from Sylvania. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. He's saying it's warm there. And we have Camille checking in from Czech Republic. We have Tony ES also checking in from Czech Republic. Okay, just reading through. So just see, just a comment, uh, it may be have Cubase on mobile too. So there is, um, so if you're looking for kind of like a Cubase experience on mobile OS, like, you know, iOS, Android, Chrome, uh, you could check out Cubasis. Uh, so it's available for iOS and Android and Chromebook. See John Costigan's working on a new recipe for watered flavored ice cream. So I think think you could market that pretty well for a lot of people there. So All right, so I just see um, Cubase. Cubase it has a mobile. Why is it only computer? Again, so check out Cubasis, C-U-B-A-S-I-S, -S, and that is designed to kind of work for um, for mobile OSs. All 
All right, uh, so we see um, question, how to track guitar and what requirements need? Okay, so when you go to track guitar, you know, if you wanted to record an electric guitar, and let's say if you wanted to use a microphone, uh, recording an amplifier, you could, you know, you just need an audio interface with a microphone input with a mic pre so that you could adjust the gain of the microphone. So many, most audio interfaces that are sold that are designed for home recording will have a microphone input. So you could use the mic gain to adjust the gain coming out from, the, you know, from the microphone to be recorded in. So what you would do is go to Cubase, go to your audio connections. By default, you may have an, like a stereo in. You want to say, you know, I have my stereo input. And I wanted to use input one for a microphone from a guitar. So let's say I want to add an audio track. We'll say I want to use input one for the guitar and I want it to be a stereo track or a mono track. And then once we're here, we could automatically record, enable the track and then monitor the track so that we could listen to the recording through the audio interface when this button is on. If we have an acoustic guitar or we are connecting uh, an electric guitar directly into the audio interface, you wanna make sure that there's a high Z input. Uh, so like I know in our UR interfaces, if you go into input two, there's a switch and that will switch the impedance uh, to match the output coming from your guitar so that it's at the optimum level for the impedance of the audio interface. Uh, if you are recording through like some type of processor, you know, think of it, you know, a Kemper or a Line 6 type of, you know, effects processor that has amp emulations, instead of using the microphone, take the analog output of that and connect that into your audio interface. Some of those units will also have a USB output and you could connect USB directly to the computer and use that for your input source as your audio interface. All right, so we have a question. Um, how do you convert audio to MIDI? You know, so generally, you know, that's always a, a tricky thing to do, but if we have um, you know, and it could work in Cubase if you have like a monophonic source. So if you have like a vocal saxophone part, uh, or like a bass part, it's not, it's not going to work if you have like, you know, piano playing chords, or if you're going to have, you know, guitar chords, we can extract the guitar chords, but it's not going to turn it into MIDI. Um, so the technology is still fairly young, like the chord detection works really well, but figuring out all the harmonics for, uh, to get a really accurate MIDI, uh, representation, but I'll show you how we could do it on for polyphonic stuff still quite isn't there technologically. Uh, but I'll show you what we could do for like a monophonic source. So if I wanted to come to this bass part, we could come over here and we'll go to our very audio and we'll just figure out kind of what it's gonna do. It's analysis of our part. So this could be a vocal, bass, you know, saxophone, trumpet. So a note, an instrument that's playing one note and not playing harmonies or double stops or chords. Uh, and then we'll say, I want to go to my functions and let's extract MIDI. Um, and at this point we could just say, I wanna create a new MIDI track and we'll hit okay. And now when we come over here, this is our MIDI from our bass part. So we would, you know, go to the, double click, go to the sample editor, go to, click on edit very audio. It's gonna do its analysis of the monophonic audio part. And at this point, just choose extract MIDI. All 
All right, wonderful to see Mark Rabin on the live stream. Hope you're doing well. All right, we have Pocket Drummer is finally watching a, a live live stream, so welcome. Glad you could make it. All right, so we see uh, Sable Winters is saying, uh, the excellent article on the Talking Club Cubase with Greg Undo. The Q&A was on point. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the article. It was kind of fun to to actually, you know, be interviewed for all the great work, uh, all the work that we've been doing here. Hang on, my son is knocking on the door. All right, my son's officially bored, so. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on. Um, all right, see, kind words from Cubase Junkie. He just says, much love to Greg. He's a great influencer and teacher, so thank you for the kind words. Okay, um, so I just see from JVI, um, so uh, says log in to Studio PC to ask if you saw my email earlier, the question regarding renaming tracks. So uh, we'd be able to do it today or will it be for Tuesday? So if you want to re-ask a question, JVI, I, I'd be happy to try to get to it today. Sorry, I, I did see the email coming right before. Apologize for that. And we're glad that your daughter gave you permission to uh, log into the live stream on her computer. Please say hi to your daughter for us. All right, so we see a question from Uno Memento. How much would it cost if you, Greg, came to my studio for a couple of days to teach me practical Cubase functions? Well, no need to talk about money. You get an apartment and food benefit from us. Um, yeah. I'd probably need to get an airplane ticket to go to Finland too, which I've always wanted to go to, so. But I've gotten to help out a lot of wonderful people. It's been a thrill. Okay, so we see from Jovanovic 3D says a uh, respectful reminder for a walkthrough YouTube video for score editor for us beginners. I just bought Iconica Opus, but I'm lost in all settings and options in the score editor. Um, yeah, so I have it on my list. So, you know, um, I'm kind of starting next week, kind of doing a whole other round of tutorial videos. I think like every Wednesday for the last two or three months that they've kind of released a new um, like how to video that I've submitted like, you know, in March or so of last year. So, so it's on my list of kind of getting started with the, with all the new round of tutorials. And if there's other tutorial topics you want to see, just please feel free to let me know at Cubase, club Cubase at steinberg.de. See Sable Winters just saying thanks, Greg, and a very audio monophonic track to MIDI. I'm doing it now in several tracks. All right, so I see from Frank, uh, does anyone know how to send MIDI data from a spreadsheet to Cubase to build MIDI automation? Um, so I don't know many people have done that. You know, I would say that if you're going to get MIDI data out of a spreadsheet, I'm not sure if it's actually generating a standard MIDI file that would be kind of a typical uh, exchange protocol between different things. Um, 
So, uh, but let me know if, you know, I'm kind of an Excel idiot myself and, you know, I would be, you know, so anytime I, you know, think of people learning Cubase, I always think of myself with Excel because I just, you know, really stupid with Excel. So, and I watch like the most basic tutorials on YouTube to try to figure out one simple thing that probably my son knows how to do and, and he, as he's going into fourth grade, so. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, hi from Cameroon. Uh, is there a way to slow down the tempo to divide it by two when performing the MIDI recording? Uh, any tip like in some other DAWs? So yeah, let's, we could do this with the Project Logical Editor. So let's say if I wanted to Let's say where we have kind of an active tempo track and I was having a hard time playing it and I just wanted to hit a button and then choose to, you know, divide our tempo by half. So let's say, uh, so we look at our tempo map here. So if I wanted to divide the tempo quickly in half and then record a part and then have it jump back, uh, all we would have to do is we'll come over here. Let's go to our project, um, project logical editor, and let's go to our setup. So let's say we want to transform, um, and we'll just start this from scratch. Um, transform and let's say media type is equal to tempo and what I want to do is we will choose to uh, and under the event transforms we're going to choose trim and let's divide by two okay so now um, So let's say we'll, we're listening to our tempo. I'll hit apply. And if I undo, now if I wanted to also, if I wanted to quickly switch, I could say, let's duplicate this track version of the tempo run that function. So now I could switch back and forth between the track version, so I could listen to it at the original tempo. And then if I needed to play a real complex passage, let's do it at half the tempo. And then let's go back to our original tempo. Let's do a half tempo. So again, to kind of half the tempo or double the tempo, go to the project logical editor. And at this point, um, we want to transform Media type is equal to tempo, trim as the action target, divide by two, or you can multiply by 0.5 if you want it. So at that point, you could just, um, and then if you do duplicate a track version, you could have one track version at half tempo, one track version at full tempo. So let me know if that works for you, Dolly. All right, wonderful to see Kevin on the live stream. Glad you got your computer working for you.
Okay. Um, so we just see question. Uh, hi, Greg. I'm not getting the edit instrument to show on the first time, uh, on the second time with battery VST, how to do it. So I don't have battery on this, um, but check to see, like, if you do this, like, let's say I edit the VST instrument, like here, it's going to open up uh, Halion. Okay, so, you know, as soon as I do this, um, so it may take a second depending on the instrument itself. So, but that always loads. Um, there is a preference that, you know, might help. Uh, so I think if we go to uh, editing, let's say to maybe to plugins that, um, you know, check to see if you go to VST plugins that we have open uh, effect editor after opening it and also plugin editors always on top. So these, so go again, go to preferences, to VST, to plugins and make sure that, you know, you get open plugin editors to always on top mode. So, it, you know, and it could be that, you know, maybe we have uh, the instrument opened up. We have the editor open. Um, and that you click somewhere else. And if it's not set to, you could right click uh, at the top. And if it's not set here, that maybe you have um, a different window that's, you know, maybe over on top of it. And sometimes people, and if you go to like your windows view here, you might be able to see batteries. So sometimes people will have like, you know, six things set to always on top. And then, you know, you go to open something and then, you know, something is behind another window that's on top, you know, if that makes sense. So sometimes, you know, people, you know, will just have the window kind of hidden behind. So if you go to the window menu, see if you actually just kind of click there. And if you see the window and if you see it listed there, then that would indicate that maybe it's being blocked by another element or another window that's on top of it. Hope that makes sense. All right, we want to thank Jazz Dude for his vigilant moderation. Appreciate it. And we're glad that John Koskin has found 84% love. So that's good to know. All right, so we see from Dolly Smarty uh, just saying, I'm also going to say thanks because the live streaming is helping us a lot. Uh, thanks to all you do. So you're welcome. All right, we see Sable Winters may miss the Zoom, so hopefully you can make it, but thanks for letting us know. It's always great when you're on. All right, so I'm just going to post the Zoom meetup here. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Okay, so we see from uh, Dolly Smarty, uh, how can I fix my MIDI recording uh, that always comes a bit early when I finished recording them? All right, so one thing you could do is always, you know, there, there are some MIDI interfaces, uh, you know, that tend to record slightly early on time. One thing you could do is try to um, turn off your delay compensation here or toggle this and see if that makes a difference. If you hit uh, Alt or Option, I think, plus K, you'll get just a virtual keyboard, which will allow you to uh, play, you know, particular MIDI notes and passages here. So let's say, so let's say if I just want to use my computer keyboard, like the Q, W, E, R, T, Y. So see if you, if you record with this, and it records in time, that's going to indicate that it's going to be like a setting with your particular MIDI 
interface, you could try setting it, you know, from all MIDI inputs directly to your controller keyboard or your MIDI device or the interface where your controller is connected to, see if that makes a difference. Uh, and if you're on Windows, uh, if you come over here to the studio setup and let's say we go to the MIDI port setup, you may also um, see a number of different elements for um, if you wanted to use ignore MIDI port filter, if it's an, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> an older MIDI driver for the particular uh, device, if it was like a MIDI driver designed for like the Windows XP era, um, you may have settings for ignore port filters. You could try to adjust that, but you know, you see if you can, if you have, once you hit alter option plus K, that once you come here, and see if that records in time. And if that does, that indicates that it's gonna be like, you know, particular to your particular uh, MIDI controller or MIDI interface on the input stage. All right, Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button again. All right, uh, so we see question, uh, is there a way to make the project logical editor always on top? It keeps disappearing when I watch videos and browsers. Um, so it could be that, let's say, if we come to the project logical editors, you know, some things will disappear when, you know, some windows will disappear as we get into more things. So maybe if we set it up where Let's say I have my Cubase here, and if I have my browser, so um, so, but um, but I don't think that there's an always on top for this uh, particular uh, particular function there. Um, but, you know, and we see it sometimes with video that when you switch to another program that, you know, different programs will do that. So, sorry about that. Okay, so we see Mark Ravens waiting for the host to start the meeting. So, we'll be there probably about 10 minutes or so. We'll transition over. Nick is saying, you, you know, that the host is probably busy, so. Okay, so we see Mark Rabin is sitting at his desk debating what his next creation will be, a pivotal moment. So I hope it turns out great. Okay, so we have a question. Um, is it possible to map uh, the new MIDI remote, uh, the faders of my controller to some standard MIDI CC like expression or dynamics and control room by different faders, of course? Yeah, so if you're doing that, you know, um, so let's say if I go to the MIDI remote, you know, so if you want it, uh, you know, particular faders here, so let's say, you know, I want it, let's just go to my, uh, have my choice sauce controller here. So let's say I wanted, you know, four, I wanted the first four controls. And let me just deactivate this quickly. Okay, so when I come here, I'm just gonna, let's do a new device. All right, so I'm just gonna click here. So if my controller has, so we'll say, okay, we'll go come over here to, all right, so go to my choice sauce. Okay, 
Okay. No, the 100. Okay. I'll just call it 1000. Okay, so and I'm the script creator and I'm gonna just select my choice OS controller ports here. Okay, so if I wanted particular controls to like the first four controls to spit out modulation, volume, expression, and panning. Okay, so um, what I would do now is just say I want it only these particular. So let's go ahead and make um, just like a fader here. So instead of uh, using all eight. You know, so if I want the first four just to do standard MIDI CC, and I wanted the next four faders to come, let me just, sorry. I'll just make this a little larger so it's easier to see. All right, so we'll just say, okay, I want it. this uh, I will and then you know I have these four faders and let me just let me just resize these quickly sorry about that make this a little more okay so I want the first four faders to just do uh, standard CC stuff so So as I would, let me just start from scratch again. Okay, so I just don't include the, C, the faders I want for standard CC to be done. And then I could just employ the other faders on the choice OS controller here. So I'm just using other uh, you know, not every single fader, but just my last four faders are doing stuff for the MIDI remote and the first four just transmitting different MIDI CCs. So you could definitely do that. All right, so we see a feature request for the project logical editor to always be on top. All right, pass that along. All right, I'm gonna paste the uh, Zoom Meetup link here again. And we'll post it in just a couple minutes. Through comments here. All right, we see Captain Energy Music just asking who's coming to the live stream. I guess the Zoom meetup. So. All right, so we have a question uh, how to navigate uh, left and right um, in the arrangement with uh, the computer keyboard. So if you just use like the plus. So let's say if I'm here uh, and I just wanted to go earlier or later in time, let me just set my tempo faster here. So if I wanted to hit the minus key on a numeric keypad or hit the plus key, and if you hold down a shift key, you could go faster. So if you wanted to navigate that, if you wanted to navigate by events and you have selected events, um, you could just I think if you just come over here, we could just say, okay, I wanted to go to this event. And then if you wanted to navigate to the end, you could hit N or B to navigate to different events, like to next and next event and back. 
So you could do that or just kind of plus minus just like that. So you don't have to use the mouse. All right, we'll miss John Koskin on the Zoom meetup. All right. Okay, so we see um, Okay, um, please show again how to auto color a track when adding new track, thanks. Okay, so let's say if I'm here, so it's just gonna be a preference. So let's come over here. Let's go to preferences. Uh, and I think if we go to user interface and go to here, we'll say track and mix console channels. So we could say, um, like I usually use use previous track colors plus one. So if I come here and I add an audio track, it's gonna add the track and it's gonna add the next. Um, so if I add like four tracks, it'll just automatically increment the colors based upon my color scheme here. Um, so again, you could just have it set. If you have it set to default colors, we come over here, so let's go to preferences to user interface to track and mix console channels. And then uh, if you use just default colors, it's not going to, it'll just won't really, you know, give it like a pretty boring color. So if I just say, okay, let's add a track, you know, it's kind of without color, but as soon as we again, go to that preference here and say, let's go to use previous track color plus one, I think that's a good setting so that you don't have always the same a uh, particular track. So now as I come here and add tracks, it'll just automatically increment the track colors like so. All right, see there's one more question before we move and migrate over to Zoom. Okay, so we'll do the last question. Uh, could you show how to quickly group tracks to buses? And if I add new tracks, I want to route to existing buses. Okay, so let's just jump back to this project. I'll activate this project. Okay, so if I wanted to take all of these tracks here, so I have multiple tracks, uh, I right click and we go to add track and then we will uh, add group channel to selected tracks. And now we'll create a group. Um, so we have this as group one, let's say we'll call it drums and we can name it as we create it. Uh, but let's say I wanted to add this track. Uh, let's say I wanted to add a new track uh, so we'll say add audio, uh, and then for the audio outputs, we could just say, let's send it to the drums and then it's automatically routed to the same, uh, group track. Okay. So we just see feature request resize some plugins, uh, you know, so some of the plugins are resizable. Um, so it depends on the individual plugin. So. But sometimes, you know, pe resizable plugins get into problems when people make it too small and then they don't see all the particular options. So, but a lot of the plugins you can resize in Cubase. All right, so with that, we will go ahead and uh, migrate over to the Zoom. I know we have some people waiting. So I'm gonna post the Zoom link one more time here as we transition over. So and if you haven't done this, you know, it's a great way to meet people and it's always really fascinating discussions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the Zoom meeting. Bear with me. So we just posted the Zoom link. All 
All right, so we have Jan, we see Mark Rabin, Andre. Nick. All right, we'll give it a couple minutes and we'll keep the And once again, we'll be doing the next Club Cubase live stream on Tuesday, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. All right, so we have Soren joining, as well as Thomas. All right, we'll just wait another minute on the live stream, and then we'll migrate over to the Zoom. All right, so we have Brian. So we have, I think, Best Korean Jesus, BKJ. All right, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the live stream. So. Thanks everyone for all the great questions. We hope that everyone has learned a new tip or trick. And once again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that and also uh, give a thumbs up. And we'll see everyone on Tuesday starting at 1 p.m. Everyone, please take care, stay safe and healthy.